All right. So um, to get started, I just wanted to say a quick hello and welcome to everyone. I'm Hannah. I'm the assistant director here at the Blue Hill Library. And thanks to you all for being here this evening uh, and joining us for this event. This is the first uh, event in our Robert K. and Linda B. Slavin lecture series, which was made possible by a generous gift to the library's endowment in honor of longtime library friends, Bob and Linda Slavin, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, this gift was made by the Anahata Foundation. Uh, that same foundation also honored Ruth or Rudy Slavin um, by funding a new teen services position, which started earlier this year, and that's been going really well. So. We are so grateful to them for providing us the opportunity to um, host some really great events and provide some new services to the community. And we've chosen uh, to focus this new lecture series on issues of racial justice. So we are so excited to have Shay Stewart Foley of Black Girl in Maine Media joining us tonight. Um, people have literally been asking me to bring Shay to the library for years <laughs> and I, really wanted to bring her here in person. Maybe we'll still have another chance to do that someday, but um, she graciously agreed to ship the event that we had planned um, to this virtual format under these circumstances. So uh, we're bringing her to the community virtually and I'm really grateful to her for, for this opportunity. Um, just to share a little bit about Shay, uh, she's originally from Chicago and relocated to Maine in 2002. She's worked with low income and at risk youth in Southern Maine, and she's currently the executive director of Community Change Incorporated, which is a 50 year old anti racism organization based in Boston. She's been blogging since 2008 through her Black Girl in Maine website. And in 2011, she won a New England Press Association Award for her writing on race and diversity for the Portland Phoenix. Her writing's also been featured in a wide variety of publications, both in Maine and nationally. Um, she's done a great TED Talk, and she's been in several anthologies. She's a graduate of both DePaul University and Antioch University, New England. And even though she works in Boston now, she's uh, still operating as Black Girl in Maine, residing in Maine, and uh, sharing her stories and experiences. So everyone, virtually welcome Shay. <laughs> and, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Shay, to get everyone acquainted with what we're going to do tonight. Great, great. Well, I am pleased to be here with you uh, this evening. I'm going to tell you that uh, since the world sort of took this upside down thing, you all are the first group that I'm speaking to on a solo speaking engagement. I've only done one other speaking engagement via Zoom since the world crashed, and that was an event I had spoken at like a, a couple years ago with the writer Debbie Irving. Um, so I have to admit, it's, you know, if anything seems a little weird, it's all a little weird to me. Um, I'm not used to speaking in this format. I'm used to being able to sort of read the energy of the room, often talking to people before I start talking, you know, I, I launch into my thing. So I'm feeling a little bit like, this is really, really weird. And even now, just like realizing the screen is focused on me, I'm like, oh, Lord, I have to stop looking at myself. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. As Hannah mentioned, we've talked, oh God, at least for two years now about me trying to get to Blue Hill and my previous life work experience. I was traveling 10 to 12 days a month in Boston or out of state. So it was really hard. So, you know, the upside is I'm home like everybody else and I'm delighted to join you. Um, Hannah gave me a little bit of my background and I'm just going to fill you in on a little bit more because I think it's really important to understand the perspective uh, of which I come to you this evening. Um, I moved here from Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. I grew up working class. Um, I lived in predominantly black and brown spaces, though I always went to predominantly white schools just because of how the education system was set up. And when I moved to Maine, it was a really jarring experience for me. Um, it actually, I've often likened it to, it felt like I had landed on a, on a different planet. <laughs> And the only way that I could sort of grapple with the overwhelming sense of whiteness was to like put it into words, um, especially because where I first lived in Maine, I lived down in Saco, there were virtually no people of color. Um, that's changed a lot, but it's still kind of weird. I currently reside on Peaks Island. Um, a lot of my work has really been born out of my experiences in Maine. Uh, I would say two parts. I have an undergraduate degree in African-American studies, um, 
And that prompted me to really start thinking a lot about how we don't teach history. There's so much that none of us normally get. And then that was combined with moving here and really seeing like what it's like when people have no, no real form or reference to other people. So that really guides my work. I also have two children. My son, who's 28, he's a musician. Um, so he spent a good chunk of his teen years here, which also heavily influenced my writing um, after he started to have some really racialized experiences as a teenager. Um, two of them that I often talk about in speaking engagements. He was 16, went to a store. Long story short, he got brought back home in the back of a police car because an officer thought that he looked like a suspect who had been breaking into cars. Um, interestingly enough, the suspect turned out to be like six inches shorter than my son and wasn't my son, but it was really an eye-opening experience for me. So that's how I kind of come to you in this work. Um, even now, the work is still evolving for me. As Hannah mentioned, I run an anti-racism organization um, that's actually 52 years old. I guess I need to update my profile. So I've been the executive director of CCI now since 2014. and doing the work as my actual job along with being black in America definitely continues to inform my view around this work. Um, what we're going to do tonight is a program that I developed called Authentic Dialogues and it was really geared towards a request that I had gotten for years from groups in Maine, how can we learn to talk about race? Um, I believe that learning to talk about race for white bodied people primarily, um, it has to be intentional. The way our society is set up, you don't normally know how to talk about race. Um, so this event is sort of a, a little baby step towards being to, able to do that. Um, it's in three parts. I'm going to talk for a little while. I have some remarks. And then you will be broken into breakout groups. Um, you'll be given about 15, 20 minutes in that group. Then we come back together and do some sharing. So that's where we're going to start for the evening. Um, I'm also going to let you know, so the other oddity of this format is typically I'm speaking, there's a podium. If I have notes, you wouldn't know that I have notes because it's on the podium and I'm doing the up-down thing. However, like you all, I'm in my house, so my iPad is sitting here with my notes. Um, and I actually, in my notes, I even wrote a little note to remind myself to tell people that um, I think it's important to hear the words rather than the performance. And a lot of times we look for perfection in people and perfectionism to me is something that's deeply rooted in systems of whiteness. Um, I did a TED talk a few years ago where I almost got kicked out of the lineup because I had notes. And I said, and it was very, very funny. It was a huge deal when I showed up at the rehearsal and I had note cards. You know, most of the time you see TED talk speakers, people think that TED talk speakers, um, like there's something going on there. And I'm like, no, you actually have to memorize all of it. It's like crazy. And I could only memorize like the first 10 minutes and it was like 18 minutes or whatever. So anyway, um, the talk we're about to have is about having authentic conversations on race. And yet in order to have an authentic conversation on race, we have to have a shared language and understanding of our history in the United States. As we bear witness to the current uprising in this country, it's becoming clear to me that many of those of us who have claimed to be anti-racist, we have erred in our thinking. We made assumptions, and the truth is, despite all the anti-racism books that are currently the rage at this moment, and all the talks and people like myself, we aren't moving the needle on race in this country. To discuss race, and more importantly, to hold authentic conversations requires courage for white-bodied people. Discussions on race are not a voyeuristic effort. This moment is not about being heartbroken for black people. It's about being heartbroken for white people as well. Because as awful as, as things have been for black folks and other people of color, they have been worse for white folks. Because living with half-truths about your reality can never be a good thing. As we begin tonight, I'm going to share our agreements for this session. I ask that if you stay with us, that you honor the agreements of this space. First agreement, locate yourself. Just center yourself in your body, feel what you feel. Um, I invite you to take a deep breath at this moment, just to locate yourself. Listen to understand. Be willing to experience discomfort. 
expect and accept non-closure. We're discuss discussing a foundational problem within our country. This evening is not going to solve anything, sorry, but it will move you closer to your truth. Confidentiality, particularly once we get to the po portion where you are in small groups, I just ask that you maintain confidentiality. Obviously, we'll have you share out, but you don't have to point out who said what or anything like that. We don't need to know that. Um, lastly, brave space, not safe space. Talking about race, especially for white bodies, is not going to be safe. So I ask you to lean into being brave. So hopefully you can sit with those truths. Next up, we're gonna create some shared language for this evening. I apologize, but one of the challenges as I realized in crafting tonight is because I don't know who you are, I don't know where you enter this evening. So in order to make sure that the conversation flows, it's really important to me that we have a shared language, shared vocabulary, so that we're saying the same thing because one of the uh, common problems often when we talk about racism is that we're actually not talking about the same thing. Um, so our shared language tonight starts with the fact that white supremacy is the deep-rooted and long-standing exploitation, control, and violence directed at BIPOC folks. And just let me explain that acronym that is Black Indigenous People of Color. I use it a lot, so I want to make sure people know what BIPOC means. Uh, with a deeper disdain for Black folks in particular, which is often referred to as anti-Blackness. The benefits of white supremacy accrue to white-bodied people, particularly to male, white, Christian, cisgendered, ruling, or owning class people. Racism is often distilled down to prejudice, ignorance, or negative thoughts about people of color, but that's not accurate. Those are the side effects of a white supremacist system. In order to talk authentically about racism, we have to understand that racism operates on four different levels, starting with interpersonal racism. Most of the racism that is often discussed is at the interpersonal level. That includes personal acts of harassment, exclusion, marginalization, discrimination, hate, or violence towards an individual or group based on their racial identity. Hate crimes, racial profiling, job or housing discriminations, discrimination are examples of interpersonal, relation, uh, interpersonal racism. Next up, we have institutional racism. Racism is built into all of our institutions in this country via the policies, procedures, and everyday practices of our healthcare and education systems, the job market, the housing market, the media, the criminal and legal systems, just to name a few. Without an intention to be anti-racist and to challenge those systems, just by following the rules of the institutions themselves will produce outcomes that more often than not will benefit white people and create harm for people of color because the rules themselves are designed to reproduce racism. I saw someone had a question there about whether or not there will be handouts. I'm sorry, I didn't give any handouts, but what I can do is send Hannah some information so that she can make that available to folks after the fact. My apologies for that. <clears throat> Next up, we have structural racism. And structural racism is the marriage of interpersonal and institutional racism. And it creates the system of structural racism, meaning that the racism of different institutions overlaps, reinforces, and amplifies the disparate treatment of BIPOC folks. An example of this would be the school to prison pipeline. Racism within our schools, as well as the racism within our criminal and legal system produces a society which disproportionately limits the educational opportunities of young people of color and disproportionately disciplines them and locks them up. <clears throat> there was a story a couple months ago now that went national about a young woman of color in Michigan, I believe was the state, um, who during the pandemic around March or April ended up being sent to a juvenile facility because she had been skipping her online classes. It turned out that this young woman had some documented le learning disabilities along with an IEP. She had had some situations with her mom and was on probation 
for some incidents, almost from my understanding, that stemmed from the issues that she had. However, because she hadn't logged on online and it sounded like there had been some issues in the home, which we know a lot of kids at that time were having issues logging on to class, um, a judge actually sent her to a juvenile detention facility. And that is a perfect example of how the <clears throat> school to prison pipeline works. Uh, my last understanding, the young woman was actually, after the story went national, they got a lot of attention, she was released and she's back home with her mom. Um, but I wanted to just use that example because as I was writing this, it was actually like the one thing I thought like that was a perfect example of like how this system unfairly treats young people of color. Lastly, we have cultural racism. Cultural racism is reinforced through systemic and pervasive images, pictures, comments, literature, advertisements, and online media portrayals of BIPOC folks often as being inferior, lazy, sexually manipulative, infantile, and overall less smart than white folks. I also want to define whiteness because it's a word that I tend to use often. White, white supremacy and racism is based on whiteness, which is an evolving boundary separating those who are entitled to certain benefits from those whose exploitation and vulnerability is subject to not being white. Whiteness creates the rules and determines our societal norms. Now <clears throat> that we've created a shared frame, I'm gonna talk about why Black Lives Matter and why it matters that you can say those words and take action to show that you are in support of Black Lives. The racial moment that we're experiencing as a nation, while it's really disturbing for many and jarring, especially against the backdrop of this global pandemic, this moment is not new. In this country, we have been here before. It's simply another reminder how as a nation, we have successfully avoided the affirmation of black humanity. It's been over 400 years since the first enslaved Africans were brought to this country and forced to build a nation that would eventually become a superpower based off the labor of those enslaved Africans. In other words, hundreds of, free, hundreds of years of free labor gave this country a powerful head start, which is not unlike the way in which white bodied people, despite their socioeconomic standing, all have a head start in this country. Even after slavery ended, black people were relegated to a second class status of terror which was reinforced through various laws that did not legally end until 1968. In fact, it was in the summer of 1967, for those who may remember that, that were a series of race riots that uh, rocked the nation, primarily in Detroit and a few other cities. Um, <clears throat> and the federal government was pretty much like, what do we do about this? In fact, at the time, it was referred to as, what do we do about the Negro problem? President Lyndon Johnson ended up appointing a commission that would come to be known as the Kerner Commission. And their findings at that time were astounding, in part because the report is best summed up by its uh, opening, which is, our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. In short, that commission report found that the racial riots of 1967, which were almost identical in some ways to what we're seeing now, were a direct result of unfair and unequal treatment by whites. Like today, most white people were living racially siloed lives, and black folks did not have equal access to the same things such as housing, jobs, water, etc. The report had some really amazing findings that included uh, reallocating some federal resources to make changes in black communities, as well as other prescriptive actions that essentially never saw the light of day. On the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report, which was in 2018, that report was revisited by many, only to find that many of the same issues of 1967 were still plaguing the country. In fact, at, in 2018, two years ago, concerns over civil rights, racial division, and racial disparities are in many ways more pressing than ever. Um, I would say that two years later, yeah, they definitely were more pressing when you look at where we are in this nation now in this moment. With a few notable exceptions, life has not gotten better for black folks in this country since that time um, in 1967. Um, with an administration that is happy to stoke the flames, the racial flames, I think it's safe to say that our uh, racial problems have gotten a lot worse in this country. And the reason this brief history lesson is important is that if you understand where we have been in this country, 
you might be able to start thinking about where we can go in this country. You also can't have an authentic conversation on race without discussing and owning our authentically painful racial history. In 52 years, starting from the Kerner Commission report, conditions overall, they haven't improved because we're still living with those same oppressive structures that were in place both in 1968 and before that. And the uncomfortable and painful truth is that black lives from a structural and institutional perspective don't actually matter because if they did, we'd have a better system in place. And while most of our conversations in this moment on black lives have been centered on the painful and horrific extrajudicial shootings and killings of often unarmed black people, which thanks to the advent of technology and social media, we can all witness, the reality is there's no section of black life that is not framed through a white supremacist lens and impacts black bodies from birth to death. Black women have higher rates of pregnancy-related mortality. Pregnancy-related mortality for a black woman with college degree is 5.2% higher than her white counterpart. Overall health and outcomes for black folks, even with college degrees and higher incomes, is far worse than it is for white peers. Um, just a few years ago, there was a study that came out where medical students actually admitted they thought black folks had higher pain thresholds and were not inclined to treat black pain. When you think about that in the context of how that affects medical treatment, it's pretty astounding and it also begs the question, how much needless suffering happens due to racial bias? We also know that the rates of incarceration are higher for black folks due to racial issues. For those of you who can go back in time, and I was a teenager at the time, you may remember the drug wars and all the, the war on drugs in the 1980s. Um, there was a big talk, a lot of things going on at that time which resulted in blacks and Latinos being incarcerated at higher rates <clears throat> due to the discrepancy in sentencing around the drugs themselves. Meaning that uh, white folks who, if they were arrested and sentenced and they were caught with powdered cocaine, they often received a, a lighter sentence than a black or Latino who had crack cocaine. If you recall, powdered cocaine was far more expensive than crack cocaine. So even within that context of dealing with illicit drugs, there was still a racial component. Um, don't forget that, you know, those same wars at that time when people were arrested or they were addicted to drugs were considered criminal matters, often which decimated black and Latino communities. And yet, if we look in this current moment at the opioid crisis, which has been going ongoing now for several years, um, the opioid crisis has been framed as a public health matter, in part, who's been most uh, disproportionately affected with the opioid crisis. It's been white folks. Um, so white addicts will receive compassion that has been historically denied to their black and brown counterparts. In fact, the ongoing opioid crisis demonstrates how the system chooses who to humanize and who not to humanize. That plays out at a structural level. Again, it's a reminder, racism is woven into all of our structures. Whether it is a child skipping school perhaps because they don't have access to the internet or they have other things going on and they don't have the supports that they need or a drug addict needs, who needs treatment. Your destiny is largely determined by race and in America, you will often find grace. And if you're white, you often won't find that grace. Which means as a white person, while it is critical to understand how racism operates on an interpersonal, institutional, structural and cultural level, it's also important to understand how racism has shaped your sense of self and whiteness internally within yourself. You need to understand how whiteness is the guiding lens that often guides your sense of right and wrong and privileges you regardless of your socioeconomic level. White culture is the majority dominant culture and yet it is predicated on the dehumanization of non-white bodies. Until you can sit with that, most talks of racism never move beyond the superficial level, much less actively working to dismantle the system. If you're ready for that deeper dive, the work is gonna be more than reading anti-racism books or putting a sign in your yard or hearing speakers such as myself. It's gonna be about shifting your worldview and becoming more expansive. It's not about making excuses or justifications for racism. 
excuse me, I just have to say this is really weird speaking because normally I have audience response and I'm like, holy cow, this is so different. Like, I see there are all these people, but normally I can, I'm pausing now. I just feel like, ah, so I just need to put that in there. People are not, um, people are following. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, it's been interesting. The Boston Globe had this story. I think it was yesterday. I think Renee Graham had written it for those of you who follow um, the Globe and several other uh, recent polls have come out that are showing that white support for Black Lives Matter movement is dropping amongst white people. Apparently, like back in May, we were still kind of like, oh, we're trapped in our houses. And then the Floyd protests happened and there was a lot of support for, you know, with white folks. Like they were showing up at the protest. Um, it was interesting because I happened to be in Chicago. My father was dying and I spent a month in Chicago late May through late June and ended up like intersecting with the protests that were happening in Chicago. And there were a lot of white people there. It was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Um, so now apparently the numbers are reversing and people are saying they're citing the violence, the, the rioting, the looting, the violence as a key reason why they don't feel like they can support the Black Lives Matter movement. I ask you this question. If you were the descendants of people who have never been treated equitably and who have had to fight for their humanity for over 400 years, would you not be mad? Sit with that. Um, it's interesting on a personal note, I am on my father's side directly, I'm a direct lineage of my great great grandparents were enslaved Africans my father uh, who just recently passed away grew up under Jim Crow and for those who've seen my TED talk I talk about my dad a lot because um, learning his racial history how it connected to America it explains so much about my family dynamic um, so my, you know, my dad grew up picking cotton until he was 12 because my grandparents were sharecroppers um, and, you know, it was really interesting in my family. I had uncles who really didn't like white people. And, you know, I didn't understand that for the longest time. I married white guys, so I didn't quite, quite grasp that. But then when I understood, like, what had happened in our family and how that played into this larger narrative of racism, it, like, made sense. I was like, oh, God, no, no wonder they got mad when I brought my husband to the family reunion. That was like a traumatic experience for them. You know, I was like, where's this white man here? Oh, my God, I, I get it now. Um, so I asked this question, why is black anger so hard to digest? It's been so easy for people to point to the violence, uh, which interestingly enough from movement sources, some of that violence is being created by white agitators and not black protesters, but that's another story. Um, it's interesting because when you look, you know, everybody has pointed to in recent years where we had our first black president, you know, those of us who do this work or who are following along in 2008, like everybody was like floating around on this false belief, like, oh, we're post-racial, we got our first black president. We had no idea what was coming down the pike, now did we? Um, and yet when you think about it, former President Obama and his family were damn near perfect. Like, perfect. Like if we were gonna get our first black president, man had to be perfect. His wife had to be perfect. The kids had to be perfect. They were what I refer to as being aesthetically pleasing to whiteness. Like, people liked them. They were just, they were the Obamas. And yet, when you think about it, they dealt with a steady stream of racism and threats to the level that none of their, like, their former president's families ever dealt with. Let's not also forget that the current president played a role in stoking some of those racial fires of racism during Obama's two terms. So even when we thought we were becoming post-racial, that really wasn't happening at all. Like my own personal conviction is that some of the Obama years gave way to the white angst that we have seen rise up, this fear of no longer being the majority dominant culture. So it's an interesting moment to be in. So I ask in this moment, uh, in this moment, as you're asked to affirm black, that black lives matter, you have to understand why this just isn't a phrase, but it's actually a true request for the validation that has been long denied to most black folks. At this point, you're probably wondering, but when are we gonna learn how to be allies? Cause I put that into the description. Like, how can we help? What can we do? When you can say everything that I just said and understand why you are saying it and say it with conviction, 
backed up with material support and reset and resources that's actually the beginning of become truly becoming an ally understanding without shame and guilt that you are the beneficiary if you are white of a system that you didn't create but that you can actively work to change often starting in your own communities i have these questions for you how are people of color in your community treated who gets arrested in your community do your lived and stated values reflect a deep commitment to black lives and anti-racism work do you understand that in a country that has never valued black life that saying all lives ma matter is a cowardly deflection at best to be an ally is to educate mobilize and organize other white people you don't need me or any other BIPOC person to tell you how to do the right thing once you have the framing and the understanding and you start doing the work internally. Being an ally, though, does mean that you will respect BIPOC folks. You listen to us. You find out about us. You stand by our side. You are honest. You take risks. You talk to other white people. You will interrupt jokes and comments about racism, and you will make mistakes because there's no way for a white bodied person to engage in this work without making mistakes because you're ultimately dismantling everything you've been raised to, to think. Um, and in this moment, it's really important to me to just stress to people because I hear so many people coming to the work, my God, I've seen the videos and I'm heartbroken, like what can I do? Well, there's a lot you can do, but really I don't need you to feel sorry for me because if you feel sorry for me, you're only simply falling back into that trap of some version of white saviorism. And right now, we don't need any white saviors. We need, I'm going to say this, we need some white comrades at the level of the, uh, the cats who unfortunately gave, lost their lives because of that young 17-year-old white boy last week in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I understand that the two gentlemen who were killed were white men who were out there. I'm not saying you need to give up your life to the level that they did, but the fact that they were willing to put their lives on the line to in in the hopes of eventually dismantling this system, when people are truly committed to anti-racism practices for white people, that is the level at which you will get to, to understand that I have to give my everything to this. So on that note, um, Hannah, it's time to move people into groups. But before you go into your group, and maybe I'm sorry, I should have thought about this. See, this is the part where the technology I got to work on this. I'm like, I got the questions on the iPad here. Shit, I should have put them on the, the, the chat. Um, I'm going to give you questions. And so basically, I'll tell them to you. I want to know what made you show up for this talk. I want to know how did this talk make you feel? And then I want you to think about one thing you can do in your circle to be an ally in your personal circle. So hopefully, maybe somebody can just remember those. But those are the things that I would like you to to you know think about when you're in your small group or anything else that comes up um i encourage you to take one more huh? thing and i'll type them into the chat just so people yep thank you I'm more what made you story, so. great thank you because i'm like i can't type and talk at the yeah, same time we'll tag you. um what made you show up for this talk how did this talk make you feel Name one thing you can do in your personal circle to be an ally. Yeah. 